Okay, uh, so to be honest, I don't have any special expertise in Bayesian analysis. I've just used it for a while in a few studies. So this is going to be a really simple talk, nothing very sophisticated. Just bear with me if this is too simple for you. And if I say something that's completely off, please tell me later. I'll be very happy to hear that. The point here is just to show how Bayesian analysis in general, and BRMS package in particular, can be used to perform the analysis of actual data. So I'm talking to an ordinary researcher who maybe babbled in Bayesian analysis a little bit, but not that much, and wants to take the next step. And I'm going to highlight two things. Firstly, how simple it can be. So you don't need to do so much manual coding. You don't really need to be a genius to do this. And the second point is, even though you don't have to be a genius to know that much, there are a few things that are good to understand before you try. So the maybe one, one danger with making it too simple, as Paul just highlighted with BRMS, you just have a line of code and everything works, that you have to know what a little bit about what happens inside, right, under the hood. So I'm going to talk about what's the minimum requirement, what you have to understand before you actually do this. So, without further ado, the research question in this study was quite funny. So I was interested in comparing authentic and active emotional vocalization. So people laugh, scream, groan, make all sorts of funny no noises. And the way people usually study them is by asking actors to portray a particular emotion. And I was interested in whether these portrayals sound good enough, if they are close to what happens in real life. To do this, I performed a simple experiment, took 139 authentic sounds from social media, so I recorded them from YouTube, and uh, 139 actual portrayals from a few previous studies. So these are six different studies with six different collections of actual portrayals, <coughs> of which one was by professional actors and five was by just ordinary people. Participants would hear a mix of these real and fake sounds, and they would click one of two buttons. So if they think the sound is real, they would click real, otherwise they would click fake. So this is as simple as it gets. This is simple binary data, right? And we're interested in the difference in perceived authenticity. So how often would they click real for the real sounds as opposed to the fake sounds? We could also compare professional actors <coughs> with amateurs and real sounds with uh, portrayals by actors. This is a simplification. The study was a bit broader than that, but for this purpose I'm just taking one, one part of it. So the data for this subset is about 4,000 observations. We have multiple observations by the same, from the same participants for the same sounds, and we have seven different collections. We're primarily interested in comparing the sound corpora, right? So here's what the data looks like. ID, that's the participant. Then we have the sound that they heard, from which corpus the sound comes. So UT is my horrible abbreviation for YouTube. That's the real stuff. <laughs> Uh, and the response variable is, did they click the real button, true or false? So we're doing some sort of uh, logistic regression, right, with uh, multi-level models. <coughs> First, we can just look at descriptives. It looks like the probability of clicking real was, in fact, a bit higher for authentic sounds. You can also make box plots aggregating for a stimulus. And yeah, it looks like it's higher, and we want to compare this with everything else. And what is labeled hawk, that's the professional interest. So we're also interested in how this relates to this, and how this relates to everything else, right? So let's look at the model. First we have to specify the model, right? And uh, I don't think I need to say much about it after false talk. We just uh, take, let's say, the simplest mixed models. So real, that's the response variable. We're interested in the effect of corpus, and let's say we have two uh, group level intercepts for a stimulus and for a participant. And with uh, non-Bayesian uh, models, this would be just to call uh, the LME4 function GLMR, and uh, this is our model. So to do it the Bayesian way, we start by writing exactly the same formula, thanks to BMS, so nothing changes here, except for the family that will become Bernoulli, other than binomial. And basically we could stop here, this would already work, but as we also learned today, if you have some notion about the price, very good to put it in here, that's where it goes. Here I just wrote this kind of vanilla, mildly informative normalizing price. So we expect uh, the difference between different collections to be basically zero, but plus minus three standard deviation of the logic scale, so it's, it's basically very, very vague, but mildly normalizing. Then we can also say how many iterations we want to run. Let's say a thousand per chain, how many chains? Let's say we want four MCMC chains. And if we have multiple cores, it's really nice that it goes in parallel, so it's a lot faster that way. That's a really handy feature, I think. 
right? That's our model. And uh, the running time, okay, of course it's slower, right? So you, you wouldn't like to run it needlessly, but still it's not that long. So with 4,000 observations in my machine, it was about one and a half minutes. And here's also one reason, which is maybe a horrible reason to specify a prior, because it runs faster and converges better. So that's one reason why I usually put in at least some kind of prior. Mildly normalizing, because it runs faster and converges better. Okay. So once we have the model, before we start analyzing it, uh, we want to take a look. Has it converged? Does it make sense, right? The easiest way to do it is just to look at the summary. Apart from the coefficients with 95% uh, confidence intervals, we also get this funny statistic called R hat, and that's probably a good way to start. If it's one or very close to one, everything is fine. If it's much more than one, everything is not fine. So we want to check the model, see what's going on. Also, the effective sample size. If you have something like a couple of thousand, that's good. If suddenly for one coefficient, the effective size is really low, like 10, something weird is going on. So you can't analyze the model, check what's happening first, right? Another way to do it is to plot. Here I show the plots for the first few coefficients. So firstly, we see that all four MCMC chains are nicely mixed. You get this hairy caterpillars. Things are looking good. You can also look at the posterior distribution of particular coefficients. So a quick look here. Then, very handy function, I think, is the posterior predictive check, PP check, from the RMS. Uh, it's not very intuitive when it comes to binary outcomes, but for normally, let's say, distributed variables, it's very nice because you see immediately if the distribution of predicted values is close to the distribution of observed values. So once you've satisfied that the model works, or has converged, makes sense, you might want to look at the predictions. Again, marginal effects is a very quick, handy way uh, to see what the effect looks like. I would normally extract this data and make my own plot. And again, it's very simple to do. Uh, first, you just create some new data sets. So in this case, we're interested in comparing different corporate, different collections of sound. Then we use the fitted function. So we get the fitted values for our model, which is called mod. With this data, what to do with random effects? Let's say we want just uh, population level prediction. So we're not interested in uh, the probability that a particular sound will be rated as real or a particular participant will do it, but for all participants, for all sounds, so we don't take random effects into account. And we summarize the posterior. The default is mean and 95% coverage interval. You can also take medians and so on. Okay, let's say we convert it to percent. We do a little bookkeeping. And then we get our data set. So here we have all the levels of the different, all the different collections of sounds, right? This is the mean of the posterior distribution. So the probability that an average sound from the YouTube collection will be rated as real is about 68.8%, with the credible interval from 64 to 72%, and so on for all the corpora. Then we plot it. We get a very similar plot uh, that marginal effects function gives us. But here we can customize things. We can add whatever we like. We can plot the actual observed data. So we show both the raw observations and the fitted values. But what we're really interested in is comparing, so contrast between these corpora. So one question was, are authentic sounds more likely to be rated as real as opposed to actual portrayals? And to do that, we want to look at the posterior. So we don't want to compare, let's say if we want to compare YouTube with, with this one, with Hawk. And the immediate thing that comes to mind is you have the ticket values, you have the confidence intervals, you could just compare them like this, right? But that's not really a very good idea. The good idea is to get the posterior on this contrast. Let me show you what I mean. So if we use the same fitted function as before, so fitted values for the model, same new data as before, but now we don't summarize it. So instead of summarizing the posterior, we get the full posterior. Then we get something like this. So this is basically the MCMC chain, but converted from regression coefficients to fitted values for each Corpus. So if we want to compare YouTube with Hawk, we don't summarize this column and this column and compare the summaries. We can compare them for each step in the MCMC chain, and then we get the posterior on the contrast between them. So if the research question was the difference between YouTube and everything else, what we can do is take, for each step, we take the estimate for YouTube, we take the mean of all these columns, we subtract them, and then we repeat this operation for each row. So translate this into code. 
we take this column minus the mean of these columns, we get this U2 versus rest, which is a vector, 2,000 observations. So this is the posterior distribution of this contrast. We can summarize the bias histogram. So this is really the answer. If you want to know how much more likely is it that the sound from the YouTube collection will be rated as real as opposed to a sound from ectoport trails, then this is the answer. This is the posterior distribution of this contrast. And then, of course, we can summarize it. We could show the whole distribution. Or we can summarize it, for instance, with median and 95% coverage intervals. So we get something like this. The answer will be that the most credible difference in perceived authenticity is 33%. So that's the median of posterior distribution, and here we have a 95% credible interval. So that's the Bayesian way of getting this contrast. OK, the second question was about professional actors better than amateurs. Same principle. We take the difference between this hawk, that's professional actors, the average of non-professional actors, summarize it, get our answer. So how do we report this? This is maybe a, a little less obvious. So if we were doing some kind of p-value testing, let's say, we would, we would say it's either significant or not significant, right? Here, the credible interval goes from minus 2 to plus 21. So it's sort of not significant. How you report it is a little, I don't know, subjective. I would probably say this is it's not exactly zero. It's not the same as, as if it went from minus 10 to plus 10. So you can say there is marginal evidence, so there's not enough data or something like this. Or you can just say, if you don't believe it, if you think this is zero, then you say there's no difference. But you can also show the actual numbers. OK, the same. Thing can be summarized in a different way. So the posterior here covers zero, right? But what we want to know is how likely is it that professional actors are actually better? One way to say is to look at the median and the coverage interval, <coughs> right? But we could also say how many observations in the posterior are actually greater than zero. So if we take the mean of the, uh, so the probability that the posterior of the difference will be greater than zero, it gives us one number, nice. 3.9%. So we could actually write something like, we are 93.9% confident that professional actors are better than amateurs. And put this way, it suddenly looks a lot stronger than that our confidence from minus 2 to plus 20, because it's you know, 93%. If I'm 93% likely, it's going to rain tomorrow. I'm going to bring an umbrella, right? Good enough for me. And this is the maybe the less uh, less familiar way of presenting the data. So you might not necessarily want to put it in a paper unless you're prepared to answer all the questions from your reviewers. But uh, it's a cool alternative, I think, to think about. It. Right, and the third question, I'm not going to look into it. It's exactly the same. All right. Uh, what? thing to keep in mind, I think, is that this can be a little mystifying when you use the Pitot <coughs> function. So, very briefly, I think it's nice to take the actual posterior distribution of the regression coefficients at least a couple of times, and those with manuals to understand what's happening. So, basically, if you extract the raw FCMC chain, and you can do this with posterior samples function, then you see that what basically looks like is very similar to this fit matrix I showed before, but these are 2,000 credible values for each regression coefficient. And just as in any ordinary regression model, you can use these coefficients to extract the fitted values, right? So if you just perform the answer logic on the, the <coughs> regression coefficients, you get your fitted values. And I just wanted to show that it's exactly the same as you do get with the fitted function. So just to remove the mysticism, behind some of these functions. I think it's nice to sometimes go through the raw posterior, do the calculation, just to get really an intuition for what happens under the truth. Okay, and one, one more thing. So we've got our results. How do we put them in the paper? If we're not write, writing for a mathematical journal, if we're just psychologists, for instance, or do some kind of cognitive research, you don't want to write five pages about the model. So, so what do you write? And here I'm very open to suggest that what I've done in a few papers was something like this. Uh, in the methods, I would first describe the model as I would for any non-Bayesian model. So you just say you work with unaggregated data, so trial-level observations, you describe what sort of group-level intercepts, random slopes, and so on you use. You write a few words like, these models were created in span, uh, accessed with VRMS package, reference to Paul, of course. Um, priors, 
I haven't actually usually written the exact price that I use. Perhaps I was wrong. I don't know. Uh, but if you if you use something a little more sophisticated, like if you impose shrinkage price, then I definitely would mention that. All right. When you show the picture, you, you just describe it as any ordinary figure, and then you write, let's say, the solid red points show the mean of the stereo distribution of the median or whatever you use with 95% credible intervals. If you're not particularly interested again in getting questions from your reviews, you can just write 95% CI, and no one will ever know what this is. <laughs> uh, work for me. I don't know. <laughs> In results, again, of course, uh, you know, no p-values and stuff like that, but you can always just give the estimate. So, for instance, you can write percentage sounds of 33.2%, 95% again, CI, uh, more likely to be rated as real, compared to not produced intentionally. The same for the other comparisons, you just write this sort of text. That's your results section. And uh, that's really easy, right? So, if you look at this, this is the entire code. Um, that you need from specifying the model, actually even reading the data from the disk, specifying the model, checking the model, getting your contrasts, getting everything right. Apart from the plot, because the GG plot code takes as much as the rest put together. Uh, so it's easy, but again, it's maybe a little too easy. So before you really take it and run with it, I would say it's good to understand a few, a few things and. Uh, I think the most fundamental is just the nature of MCMC because it's so different in Bayesian analysis as opposed to non-Bayesian analysis. So it, it might take a little getting used to what are these long row of numbers? Where do they come from? How do I work with them? What do they really stand for? To me, that's the most fundamental thing to learn. Uh, priors, again, enough has been said about priors, obviously, good to, good to know. Uh, how to check for convergence. Again, very, very simple with existing tools. Just a quick look. Uh, one source of confusion that I, I encounter repeatedly is the difference between fitted values and the theory prediction. They are nice and they are actually two different functions in their MS, so you can easily distinguish between them. Shrinkage, really nice. So let's say we didn't have five corpora, let's say we had 20 different collections of suns. It would make a lot of sense to impose some stronger shrink shrinkage of that. Again, there are even some inbuilt tools, so it can be really easy. You don't always have to go to span and modify the code to do this. But if you do want to go to span, you can extract the stamp code that the BRMS used, right? And then you can go and modify it, customize it, whatever. It's a lot easier <coughs> than writing it yourself from scratch. So if you're a little more advanced want to do this, this, this is also the way to go. Finally, how to learn all this? Uh, there are plenty of good materials everywhere, of course, right? Uh, internet forums, discussion events such as this one. In my opinion, it's still worth problem inventing investing a little bit of time going through a book or two, because then you make sure you don't skip something that's important. You actually get the whole range. Uh, these are two that I like, actually the only books <laughs> I read about Bayesian last, like in there. They great both of them. Uh, right, thank you very much. All the materials for the presentation can be downloaded up there, including the data set if you want to play with it, the code, and so on. Thank you.